Has anyone here been to my previous talk this morning? Okay, so I'll probably at the risk of repeating a few things. Um, yeah, so today I want to talk about a real life case study with uh, involving Cloudify and Chef and other technologies. Um, I was hoping to get the, uh, the guy that heads the DevOps uh, practice of this company to come and talk with me, but unfortunately he couldn't make it. Um, so I'm going to have to keep the name kind of confidential, but if you've been to the Amsterdam conference or uh, do a little, dig a little bit of digging online, you're going to figure it out pretty quickly. Uh, so we're talking about a leading UK-based based online betting company. Um, can't say the name, but actually can use some references so you can figure it out yourselves. Um, and they've been facing, facing a pretty tough problem uh, when they tried to innovate. It started about 12 months ago. Um, they have, at peak times, about 200,000 concurrent visitors, many more, uh, probably a few times that uh, registered users, um, and a team of about 40 developers that are constantly deploying changes to their uh, website and products. Um, so they need to keep, to maintain very high loads, and need to keep it with a very high frequency of change. Um, and, you know, one of the problems that they faced is that whenever someone came up with a, a, good, a good new idea, they started to work on that, uh, and then they started, failing, they started facing a lot of walls within the organization. Uh, so the first thing they needed to do is obviously allocate infrastructure. Uh, then after that, developing this thing, which is kind of the easy part, um, and then handing it over to ops, deploying that, testing that. Um, and eventually it came to a state, again, you, you'll probably be able to read about this more in their blogs, but it came to a state that uh, it was very hard for them to innovate because people were just tired of trying to push new ideas uh, that didn't go through. Um, so they knew that they had to change something. They had to kind of uh, um, bridge the gap between, that they had between dev and ops. It's kind of what all DevOps is all about. Um, and they had to build the way that people within their, the development team could actually innovate uh, but without undermining the stability and performance uh, of their website and their, and their products. Um, so as a developer, you know, how many of you guys are developers? Ops guys? Both? <laughs> All right. Um, so as a developer, you usually start with the things you know. Um, and um, what they did is they started off with their CI server. Uh, so they started to automate things around their build system. Uh, and specifically creating more and more integration tests uh, as opposed to just unit tests that they had before um, and making sure that whenever they actually have a release or a code patch, uh, this thing is stable as far as the development team could, could do. Uh, but obviously that's not enough uh, since most of the time processes and workflows look something like that and it's not just about putting stuff into Jenkins and handing and throwing over the wall to the, to the ops team. It's about having a continuous uh, process that includes a lot of phases until stuff gets into production. Um, so still, even once they automated the build process, they had a lot of issues there. And what they wanted to do is really, really streamline the entire uh, flow from, from development to production. Um, so essentially automate everything, and I'll, I'll go over some of the stages uh, uh, in, in a few minutes. So. The first thing they wanted to do um, is um, basically automate and ensure the quality assurance process. Um, so the CI server actually runs a few unit tests and integration tests, um, but that's not enough because that's not running in the real environment in which this code would actually run in production. Um, so they wanted to build some process where they actually take the new code or the new artifacts and deploy them into an actual environment that looks as much as possible uh, similar to, to, the, to the real environment. And that means actually uh, building the environment from scratch, deploying the components on top of it, deploying the code, and running some integration tests, whether they're manual or automatic. So it's the first thing they wanted to do. Um, the second thing they want to do is actually increase the consistency between environments and across systems. So I mentioned that um, <clears throat> some of their code gets deployed into this environment, some of the code gets deployed into, into another environment, and they wanted to make sure that it's not just about being consistent across the flow of a single artifact or a single product, it's about being consistent across products. So it's easier for everyone to understand uh, what's going on. There's kind of a common tool set for everyone. 
Um, the ops basically, whenever they face a problem, no matter in which application, they can actually uh, be able, uh, they can tell what's going on there without really having to learn every application from scratch. Um, and, and why does that matter? I mean, that's, that's actually taking it uh, based on, on, on their words and what they have done. Um, so the first thing they wanted to reduce is those manual handovers. Even after they automated the CI server and everything, um, what happens behind this process when this is done is that the artifacts would get created uh, using the, the Jenkins server, uh, like jar files or war files or whatever uh, they use there. And the handover process would be like, okay, I send an email to the, to the ops guys, listen, I have a new build in that location, take it, deploy it, do whatever you want with it. And every time this process happened, this is a potential uh, um, friction point and a potential stability, an instability uh, uh, point, because there's no automated process around it. So every time, if it's one operator, he's gonna do it one way, and if there's another operator, maybe he's gonna do it a bit differently, and things would start to break. Uh, so they wanted to reduce these manual handover as much as possible. Uh, I mentioned about consistency and reliability. Obviously, when you start automating things, um, things become more reliable. Uh, that kind of uh, uh, goes without saying, because um, the less manual intervention that you have there, uh, the, more, uh, um, the more consistent and reliable it becomes. And they also wanted to create a common vocabulary. So when the dev and ops teams were kind of separate from one another, um, they weren't really speaking the same language. Okay? Devs, ops were kind, of focused on, uh, were kind of focused on servers and, and networks and VMs, and devs were focused really on application modules. Um, and when you build this kind of streamlined process that, that goes from A to Z, um, they actually speak the same language. They, they, they speak the same terminology, they have the same process that, uh, that they talk about, and they understand the entire flow of, of the way things work. Um, <clears throat> then the last bit is um, when you have a development team of about 40 people, um, things tend to get messy really, really fast if you don't enforce some sort of policy. Um, everyone kind of tries to use their own favorite tools, and more so, you know, we're talking about open source projects and, and, and products. It's really easy to just download and consume uh, whatever you want. Um, and that might be fine for the development process, but if you're a developer and you want to get things done faster, you don't really care about what the ops, how the ops are going to handle it. So if you're going to introduce something like MongoDB, and then someone would need to cluster it and administer it and monitor it, um, that's not, not something you really think about when you kind of download, start it, and uh, say, oh, this is a really cool API and can do whatever I want with it. Um, so they want to enforce uh, some common tool set and practices across the organization so that people would not uh, uh, just use whatever they want. Um, and we'll talk about some of the problems that that caused, but uh, that's kind of the goal here. Um, so this is what their uh, pipeline looks like. Um, so you can see here that um, it starts from a code commit in the development. It goes through uh, the build process, which is what they did with the CI server. Then it goes through acceptance testing, uh, which is kind of functional testing. Uh, then it goes to performance testing, which is basically a non-functional part of things, being a, make, making sure that everything uh, scales nicely and works nicely. Uh, then stability, essentially simulating failovers and other uh, extreme conditions. When that is done, basically all of those green arrows are basically uh, automatic uh, promotions from one step to the other. So when this happens, it gets pr promoted automatically to here. When this goes well, it goes to here and so on. And it basically stops here. It's kind of the difference between continuous deployment and continu continuous delivery, if you will. Okay, the, kind of the line, the line is crossed here. Uh, at this point, what they do is they stop here when this is uh, passing and then there's a, another manual step that basically is a click of a button. That's all it is that actually promotes things um, to uh, um, what they call UAT, um, just making sure that everything works properly, and then into production. And now with each, within each of these, of these stages, um, there are a lot of sub-steps, right? So if you talk about uh, the build process, right? It involves a lot, of, uh, a lot of things within it, right? So you have to check out the code, you have to build it, you have to prepare the unit test, you have to run them, prepare the integration test, run them, publish the report somewhere, um, run it, run it some, 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 some sort of a rule set on top of that, make sure that you're happy with the test results. Let's say, I don't know, 
97% success might be good enough for some people, might, be not, might not be good enough for, for others, or uh, it really matters what 3% have failed and, and these kinds of rules that they need to apply. And once they're happy with that, they're basically installing that in their code repository. I think they're using uh, Artifactory for that, for that purpose um, and notify the next stage in the pipeline. Um, so this is just an example for one of these steps. There are, each of those steps is basically composed of, of, a, lot of, of a lot of those stages. Um, so they need a way to automate all of this, and they started to, looking, to look at existing tool sets. Um, and the goal was really to build kind of a common platform that develop, both developers and ops guys can consume, and everything there would be kind of automated, so they don't really need to think about that. Uh, they actually set up a special team for that um, that uh, would basically be responsible for uh, building and maintaining this platform. Um, if you're familiar, for example, with the Netflix use case, it's kind of very similar to what they do. Um, there are teams there that build the platform, and then the rest of the team, cons the rest of the team is consume those, those services. Um, so it's really kind of a platform, a pl platform as a service. Um, and the benefits of that are kind of obvious. We talked about consistency, um, but they're also, uh, we talked about uh, um, similar tool sets um, across the entire organization. Uh, and we talk, and we didn't talk about that, but there's also a single point of governance because once you do things the same way for all of your projects, it's very easy to monitor, it's very, very easy to govern, it's very easy to uh, be present in those important control points. For example, where is it? Oh, I'm sorry, down too far. So it's, you know, being able to be here, this important control point, and do that for all of your application, not just one. Um, okay. On the on the other hand, um, there had some other issues, you know, that that this thing started to cause, and they're still dealing with those issues. So, for example, uh, the first one is that it sometimes it's too rigid, uh, and if you want to deploy, let's say, a new service that doesn't really use the same technologies, um, it can become quite challenging. Right? They're mostly Java-based shop, uh, so if you're starting to deploy, I don't know, Node or uh, a native application or something else. Um, that existing tool set might not be uh, the best fit for that, so you have to kind of evolve the platform. The other thing, um, and this is something that I think is most important for them, is I mentioned you know, people kind of grabbing tools off the internet and developing and working with that, um, and there's really kind of a, um, an evolutionary uh, process there that the best tools are being kept and the, and the, and the, least, you know, the less good tools are kind of being thrown aside. Uh, so when you actually dictate all of the tool set and all of the stack uh, from the top, you kind of lose some of that. Uh, so that's something they're, st they're still facing today uh, and, and, and uh, want to find a way to do that. Um, so they start off, you know, it it's all sounds very similar to platform as a service, right? Because it does a lot of those things. And when they started the evaluation 12 months ago, uh, they looked at these two products, which you're probably familiar with. Um, I think they also looked at a, a number of other players, um, specifically for Java, um, forgot the name, uh, the Jen Jen Jenkins guys. Um, Cloudbees, yeah. Yeah, they looked into Cloudbees as well. Um, and they reached the conclusion that A, as far as the PaaS market is concerned, and we talked about it during lunch, uh, it's still very much fluctuating. It's not really kind of well-defined. Uh, both in, both in, term, in terms of the scope of, of these products, in terms of standards, in terms of the players there, and uh, more importantly, they, uh, uh, with each of those products, they found some gaps that they couldn't kind of uh, overcome uh, if they took them as is. Um, so what they figured is that they need to build something on their own, um, and that's where CloudStack comes into the picture and, and Cloudify comes into the picture, um, and they kind of embarked on this journey. Um, and the first thing that they did is, is install CloudStack, uh, obviously. Um, I checked actually with them um, about two days ago, and right now they have CloudStack deployment of about, uh, I think it's a few hundred VMs that they're using for these processes. Um, it's still not used for production, but if you remember the pipeline there, it goes all the way up until production, uh, so all of the things that they do uh, are done with CloudStack up until production. And I guess that's a matter of time until that happens, kind of gaining the, the confidence that this can work. 
Uh, one thing that they did uh, contemplate very hard on is um, the bake versus fry dilemma. Are you guys familiar with that? So what's, what's the best way to um, automate applications? Are you baking the entire stack into the image and then just starting that as the application start? Or are you basically taking vanilla images and run an automation script like Chef or Puppet on top of them? Okay, so there are kind of arguments to here and to there. Um, when you do the bake approach, this is something, for example, that Netflix is, is doing uh, quite heavily. Um, the, the, the good side of that is that um, things are more stable because you're not dependent on package installations and stuff like that that can actually break uh, even though it worked, I don't know, a week ago. Okay, someone moved the location of the package. Uh, the internet connection is more, not working properly. Uh, so the, I don't know, apt get doesn't work, for, uh, for example. Um, so when you bake everything into the image, um, it becomes much more stable in that sense. Uh, on the flip side, you've got to have very powerful tools to be able to bake those images, to prepare them on a regular basis as part of your build process. Um, and when you do face something, and you face changes, it's typically harder to deploy them because image, images are pretty big. Uh, it takes a lot of time to upload, uh, take a lot of space. Uh, so they have kind of other, other downsides to them. Uh, interestingly enough, I think, you know, that if you guys are familiar with Docker and what they do, um, this is kind of a nice approach to, uh, um, to having not really baked images, but something that's kind of uh, uh, more lightweight, but still has all the benefits of baked images. So it's, that's something that, uh, that uh, they're looking at. And we as, as providers of Cloudify are also looking at as well. Um, when you go to frying images or, you know, dynamically configuring them, um, Things are much simpler for uh, maintenance, right? Because you just have scripts or recipes or, or manifests, depending on the tools you're using. Uh, but anyone here using Chef Puppet? How many times have you had a recipe fail on you for no apparent reason, and it worked like two days ago? Many times, usually. <laughs> so that's the problem with frying images, right? Um, on the other end, it's just source code, so it's very easy to change and track. Okay, with images, it's a bit, it's a bit uh, tougher. Um, so they decided to go to this, this approach. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you the tool chain that they're using right now. Um, and what they do is that they use, um, they provision decommission images on a, on a pair of build basis. So if you recall the, the um, basically the, uh, the workflow that I showed before, you know, of, of the steps that they go through. Um, so when they go to do integration testing and when they go to do performance testing, every time that happens, basically what, what, the, uh, uh, what the Jenkins server does is actually set up a complete new environment that's built on top of CloudStack, installing all the components on it, running the test, and taking it down. Okay, and that's how they do the testing. So that's how they make sure that across those stages, the environments look almost exactly the same because, because, it, because it's just VMs on CloudStack that gets uh, stuff installed onto them uh, on one hand. And on the other hand, it's, uh, it's really efficient because it's not taking up any additional hardware or anything of that sort because we're using a cloud environment. Um, so how do they actually fry the images? How do they do that? Um, so the first foundation here is Chef. Um, they're, they're heavily reliant on Chef. Um, every component that they use uh, within the application stack as a dedicated recipe. Um, and basically, that's get triggered and installing stuff. Um, again, you know, some, some, sometimes things can fail, especially if you're installing from uh, package, uh, package repositories and these kinds of things. Uh, but for the most part, this is working pretty well for them. Um, and then they're using Cloudify um, to basically orchestrate things on top of Chef. Uh, so what, what they do there, is basically, um, I'll try not to repeat myself from the previous talk um, that I gave here. Um, so Cloudify basically serves as um, kind of a templating mechanism to uh, define complete application stacks, right? So they have, for example, Tomcat and MySQL and Apache in front of it. There's a, there's a Cloudify blueprint that describes that. It also describes what kind of images they want. Yeah, five minutes what kind of images they want from the, um, 
uh, from the cloud stack environment uh, and zones and template IDs and all this stuff that you configure in a cloud stack environment. Uh, and then they would model that into a Cloudify recipe or a Cloudify blueprint. And basically what the Jenkins server does when a build, a build step is, is finished, it would go to the Cloudify uh, manager, trigger the installation through the REST API, build the environment, run the test, and then tear, tear everything down again through the Cloudify API. So Cloudify really serves kind of as a, um, uh, as a templating or orchestration engine uh, above the application, uh, uh, the application itself. Um, so I'm gonna skip that a bit because I uh, described it last time. Um, so this is schematically, this is kind of what it looks like, right? There's Jenkins, which is pushing the, whenever the build uh, succeeds, it pushes the application blueprint onto the Cloudify manager through the API. The Cloudify manager goes then to CloudStack, provisions the, uh, the VMs and the other resources uh, that they need for the application, and then assigns each, the, each of the VMs with the right role and triggers the Chef client on top of that VM. It actually auto-installs the Chef client as well uh, when the VM is created. Um, and then the application is up and running, basically orchestrates also the startup process, um, and, and then they can run their tests on top of this newly created environment. Um, so this is all going all the way up to, um, not to production, but the step before production. And when all these tests are successful, there's a manual step of, of going and saying, promoting this build or this uh, uh, piece of code onto production. Uh, the next step they're gonna do after deploying that to production is actually uh, adding the, kind of closing, closing the loop here. When this thing is gonna also drive things into production, uh, you can do other interesting things uh, with Cloudify. Uh, you can aggregate uh, all the metrics that they gather anyway and define some thresholds on top of that um, and basically scale things on demand, uh, scale up, down, you know, based on, the, based on their uh, environment. Um, so let's see what we have here. Yeah, we've covered that as well. Um, so um, where it stands today is that they have a fully automated uh, pipeline starting from uh, um, the uh, co code commit up until the, uh, the stage before production. Uh, promotion to production is still manual, as, as I said before. Um, and right now they're thinking about all these post-deployment aspects of you know, auto-scaling and recovery and re repairing when things fail. Um, so that's where they stand now. Um, I do have permission to share some of these links. I'm gonna put them in a slide share and tweet about it uh, with the hashtag of the conference. So you guys can actually go in and look at some of the uh, blog posts that they've posted around that. Um, this is actually part of a talk that they gave in Amsterdam, in the Cloud Tech Conference in Amsterdam, about some of the uh, organizational challenges they've had, kind of a very entertaining talk. Um, so if you're interested in this thing, um, really encourage you guys to go and read that. Very, very interesting. That's it for me. Great. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Yuri. Questions? So I already tweeted the, the link to... Uh, oh, awesome, awesome. Yeah, so great, great, you guys great. Can, can get it and uh, you can... Yeah, did just, did you say, switch company it is? I couldn't say the name. But, uh, so. uh, quick question, Yuri. What was the monitoring uh, alarming tool that they were using? Um, I think that they're looking... I think they have Nagios, but I'm not sure. Okay. Um, so, so I'm, I'm not. And so the monitoring would then would that trigger auto-scaling policies yeah, exactly, in Cloudify? Exactly. Yeah, so Cloudify would kind of, uh, the monitoring would get piped into Cloudify. Cloudify would receive those metrics, trigger the auto-scaling, or the up or down. Yeah. Yeah. So with, with the version these guys are using, H27, it's kind of a DSL on top of, uh, it's, it's Java, this version is Java-based, okay. so it's a DSL on top of Groovy. Okay. Uh, in, the, in the next release, which I described in this morning, um, it's gonna be YAML-based, and it's, 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 not a custom, it's not like a proprietary uh, language, it's based on Tosca. Tosca is, a, um, Tosca is a specification that's being worked on these days by IBM and Red Hat and other, other people for describing these kinds of topologies and workflows. And you have another talk on Tosca 
tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. If you're interested in Tosca, my colleague is giving another talk uh, tomorrow morning about it. More questions? No? Well, thanks, Yuri. All right. Thank you.